problem. Um, I was going to show actually using Sophie. Um, my name is John McIntosh, and I'm, um, most of the people in the community know who I am, but as a background, I'm the maintainer of the Squeak VM for the Macintosh, and I spent the last four years working along with um, Michael Ruger on um, the Sophie authoring tool. So actually, I put these slides together using Sophie. I was going to show Sophie, but it's set up for um, 1600 so and it's uh, 600 by 800 screen doesn't really let you work with the selfie tool for display so I'll just show the PDF um, what I currently have in progress um, since I finished with selfie earlier this spring is that I've been working on a squeak VM uh, on the iPhone and that was it's actually through some help and financing from the um, ESOG, so I have to thank them for that. And um, that's going to become the base for a complete rewrite for the Macintosh um, version of the source code uh, for 10.5 and post 10.5, because Apple is moving away from um, legacy code that they've had for the last 20 or 30 years, or is it 40 years? I think you kind of feel old sometimes when you get up in the morning. Well, we know we have to be young in the school book. Well, yes. <laughs> um, so, actually, I should probably say um, next week, Michael Ruger and I will probably release the source code for the VM for the iPhone to let people who are iPhone developers access to the source code so that they can. Um, do this. Actually, anyone can actually get Apple's SDK in theory then, um, suffer through a VM maker, and then build a VM and be able to run it on the simulator. Um, you can do that without having to pay Apple any money. Um, but if you want it on your device, you have to pay Apple money. And, but I'm sure there are people here who will figure out how to avoid that attack. <laughs> so, um, well, make an announcement probably next week. Michael's traveling um, this week after ESUG and is not able to set up the web component that he needs to oversee that. But let me talk about GStreamer. Um, this work was actually funded by Viewpoints Research. They uh, provided some funding to take GStreamer, which is an open source, I think it's GPL licensed um, code base, which lets you create graphs of objects. So it's, if people are familiar familiar with uh, data flow architectures, this basically is um, the type of environment you work with. Um, the interesting thing about it, there's really non-obvious uses for it. You first start thinking about, I have a video or audio file or both that you want to play, and then you play it to the device, but then later on you realize that Oh, you know, I can actually like pull a file from the internet and write it to the file system, so you can abuse the tool in interesting ways um, that has nothing to do with audio video because of the support that the basic components give you. Um, when you look at GStreamer, there's uh, code elements, there's the basics, um, good, bad, and ugly. What you'll find is that this code base is written for the base um, GStreamer environment, which is the approved environment on the old PC. And I mention that because when you load up the architecture, people then say, well, I want to play MPEG and other type of codexes, um, but you don't find the, the codexes in the base GStreamer uh, environment. So you have to go hunting on the internet for these other codexes that let you play the kind of media that people want to deal with. And I mentioned the thing in terms of the funding. Um, the reason it's based is because we're just supporting AUG. Um, and I think people will realize that AUG is, I think, the, I think the only open source unencumbered um, format that I'm aware of for doing um, video and audio. Where we sit, um, I believe the people at Quack have been working on a Windows version. Um, 
there's an issue for the Macintosh OS X version where we need someone on the Unix side to help build a standalone installer. Right now, you can actually install uh, ViewStreamer on your Mac if you're willing to sit with um, one of the package managers and install about 150 packages. Uh, it works almost flawlessly, except for the four or five times you have to fix a package or two to get it installed. It is available on the old PC, and in theory it's available on the Linux system. Probably most Linux systems have uh, a GStreamer package, you can just do package add or an RPM on that. In terms of the licensing, um, it's licensed under the MNT license, so people are welcome to um, go to the squeak source and then pull the packages. Um, if you want to make changes to the base, then you can email me and we'll look at incorporating changes into the base. Um, in terms of the plugin side, it's not actually full implementation of the GStreamer architecture. The, the GStreamer uh, class library is immense. And um, we only really have a subset, which lets us um, decode video, decode audio, and also it lets us um, encode audio and video, too. So it took about 100 primitive calls to make that work. I originally wrote it for 32-bit systems. If someone wants to actually do, you're going to need 64-bit people here who would like to volunteer. Yeah. And, yeah, so um, I think the people who have been working with 64-bit can appreciate you have this issue of 32 and 64-bit uh, squeak VMs and uh, images and so forth and how um, difficult that is to build and to manage. But certainly um, altering the environment so that it works in a, 60, a pure 64-bit squeak VM and image is quite doable. Um, so most of the code is in slang. Um, there's a very little piece of code that's C-based, which uh, basically lets you push data into a fake uh, GStreamer element and pull data. Um, I also adhere to having an SUNet for each publicly exposed API. So you can click. Uh, your test button and see what happens once you've built the plugin. In terms of the architecture, I have a, a proto object, a GStreamer object, which maps to um, a GStreamer object in the C C library. What you'll find is GStreamer is um, actually quite object oriented. It also uses a garbage collector. So it does its own internal garbage collection, which proved to be an issue in the implementation because in the Smalltalk site, we, mirror, we are mirroring each um, GStreamer C object with a Smalltalk object. So we have to make sure that when we release the small talk object, it releases the C object. But also, there is some shortcuts where, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, where if I have a GStreamer pipeline, for example, when I release the GStreamer pipeline, the C object sends releases to all the um, components that are making up that pipeline. And so, if I then attempt to send release messages to the, those C objects, when I finalize the GStreamer pipeline in Smalltalk, then it's going to crash. And so, as I mentioned, there is um, we have to be careful not to have this double free situation. Um, so there is an inheritance tree that I painfully created on the small talk side that ensures, how many people are familiar with finalization? How many people want to know what that means? 
Yeah, there's a few people that want to know what that means. If that's the old small talkers here can have a nap, and I'll try to remember if I can um, say it correct. Uh, finalization is what can happen is if a small talk virtual machine can tell the small talk code that um, a small talk object that you had is about to die or has died, and uh, that you. That is useful in this situation because if I'm using a, a small talk object which is mirroring a C object and it goes out of scope and it gets garbage collected, then I get this event that tells me, hey, that object was garbage collected. Do you want to know, do anything about it? And at that point I can say, well, yes, actually I need to deal with the, the C object that I allocated. Um, so I need to tell the C object to go away. Um, so that's where finalization comes in. <coughs> there is another component called resurrection, which is a, um, a fairly horrifying thing where you, you say, oh yes, I did actually just throw away that small talk object, but actually I want it back because I didn't really mean to throw it away. So I always think when people have code like that, they need to rethink their... Um, their business process somehow. Because you did ask to throw it away. So, uh, so I, I put this slide up just as a warning in terms of I think this is where the complexity of um, if you're going to add new components, because as I mentioned, I only have about 100 um, primitive calls, and there are lots of other little pieces. Uh, great detail in GStreamer that uh, I don't actually expose, but someone may, for example, need that for their particular um, usage of GStreamer. So, in GStreamer, we talk about this concept of an element. It's really a superclass um, G element, or and it's um, it's either a source or sync or both. So. For example, a source, it can be a, a, um, a microphone or a camera, but it, and then on a sync, it can be the display or a speaker, but it can be both. So, if, for example, I have this uh, volume where audio comes in as, as, um, in as a sync, but it comes out the other side as a source, but it's been altered or maybe not altered by the elements in the middle. Um, so I have some small talk code there in italics, which you can see where I call the element factory. Um, the target element is an item called volume. You actually refer to two objects by their names. And um, in a GStreamer system, there's some Unix commands that you can use to find all the objects uh, in the GStreamer system that you've installed. Because the way the system is designed is you install the base system and then you start adding all these additional um, elements. Um, also, in the Smalltalk side, of course, there is a way that you can ask the system to list all the elements for you. But in this case, I create volume. I have to give it a name because we need to be able to identify it by an alias. And later on, we can use that alias to find the object again. And um, I have a, this is actually from a yes unit check. So it actually does self should here and checks to see if the, the handle is same. And that's um, actually a handle to the C object. So it's basically confirming that the um, element was created correctly. So when we create this element, what happens is, is that we then put it into a pipeline or bin. The concept here is that you have a, a pipeline which data flows from left to right in this mesh of um, elements. And um, once you put an element into a pipeline, you then actually have to hook it up. So you have to basically do more programming in order to indicate how the data flows between the elements. And how that's done is that there's a 
um, thing called a pad on uh, element. So you also have this complexity of a pad can be static, which means it's always there, or a pad can be dynamic, which means it's created at runtime. So for example, the volume guy here would have a pad for input and a pad for output. But what the AUG decoder, for example, has a dynamic pad where once the decoder is woken up, it creates a video output or creates a audio output or it creates both. So um, there's a bit of some automatic hookup that can happen and um, to add more complexity to this type of work, you can add, ask a pad for its uh, type or its capabilities, and it actually returns a MIME string um, indicating um, what the pad supplies, if it's a source, or what it um, consumes as, a, as if it's a sink. And so um, you get the situation where it can return multiple. So for example, if it was dealing with, with video, if this video card would return, as you can see, it returned a fairly restrictive set of uh, settings. Um, but on a different video device, it could give me a much broader range of settings. The interesting thing about pads is you can actually tell the pad, um, you can give the pad a request to say, oh, you really only understand 640 by 480. So that then, that information then is um, programming data to the element. Um, and then it also restricts um, what you would get out of source. If I've lost anyone, you're free to jump in and um, ask a question. Uh, I'll have an example here about, we're going to play back a tone from a tone generator. What you'll find is if you just go out and look for G-Streamer elements, you're going to find a variety of elements created by people all over the world to do interesting things. So, so for example, someone said, hey, I need a tone generator, so they created an element that generates tones, which of course then you can feed frequency and, also, and the waveform um, description and all sorts of information into. But in this case, uh, I'm just going to create the element, call it source. Um, there's a little black box thing here called audio convert, which um, is going to take up the role of converting the audio source. Um, one of the interesting things about audio, there's all sorts of different formats in terms of what um, audio should be. Should it be a floating point number? Should it be an integer? Uh, what's the precision? Um, what's the range? All of those type of things. And so this audio convert sits in the middle and actually negotiates with the parties on either side to figure out the best um, conversion <coughs> based on um, what audio test source can do and what um, the audio device is going to do. But I'm also going to insert a volume in here so I can control the volume. And then um, we create a sync which um, talks to the platform's um, uh, ALSA. What does that stand for? Who knows that acronym? It's one of these acronyms. Linux Sound Architecture. Linux sound architecture? Yeah, okay. I think it's a, it's a particular hardware specification. But as you can see here, I create the, uh, the pipeline and then I, I add in the different elements. Um, and of course, you can have a helper method. I do have some helper methods where you can add elements together and have them automatically linked together. But I, I show this as an example of kind of the basic type of programming that has to go on under the covers. Here's where you do the linking, for example. So you say link A to B and B to C. That's the easiest case. Um, once it's linked up, the pipeline has state. So it's either in null state. It'll be in null state at this point. But then it can be in, um, I can send a plane. 
and hopefully it'll go to play state versus, um, I don't show it here actually, it can go to error state, which is a bad thing. And uh, I, so in this case, we actually play the sound for one second. It's actually asynchronously because um, the GStreamer environment actually looks after all the issues to do with uh, threading for you and asynchronously managing video and audio. So um, I set this pipeline to playing, and it's playing in the background. And I wait one second, and then I set it to pause to stop it, and then I set it to null um, so that I can release it. Um, I used to set it to pause, but then underneath the covers it whined about the fact that I would send free objects in a pipeline that was in pause state versus null state. So. Uh, Seems simple, right? And of course, as I mentioned, some helper methods where I can create a pipeline and say build and link elements and initialization. Um, and if you recall, I mentioned the issue of being able to find things. Basically, you can say find the element called because later on you may actually need that. Because for this example, I create the pipeline, but then I actually have to change an attribute of the element. So there's a, a number of, of methods. At the lowest level here, where you say set the key to a string value, um, obviously you could have some sort of the, um, a double dispatch or something to say if you're going to set this location to a and it's a string object, then you should use this particular method, which would resolve a particular primitive call. So um, we unfortunately have some evil C typing that has to go on down at the lower level at some point. Um, I, I know this G inspect element that actually uh, basically prints the documentation for an element. So as part of building a GStreamer element, the author is supposed to um, respond to the GST inspect and print off documentation that helps you figure out how to use the element. So in this case, actually, what, I, what I'm attempting to do is um, read a thousand buffers of data of a certain size uh, from a file. Because I don't want to read the whole file, I just want to read a small chunk of the file. And then, of course, I set it to playing. Um, and so let me introduce this um, get bus message. There's this whole concept of that there's a, a message bus in GStreamer, which um, the GStreamer objects send messages to. So they send status messages. So really, I, I want to um, sit and wait here until either I have an error or um, I get the message um, EOS, which stands for end of stream. And I also have another modifier where I really only want to wait um, five seconds. So we're going to wait for five seconds or a thousand um, buffer segments or some error happens, kind of thing. Um, I do know that actually I, I, the code's not quite right. It should, uh, I should be looking for EOS or error or null or something to see um, what happened for the last message. So let's um, look at a much more complex example. I think actually I have somewhere um, an image running. Yes, there we are. So in this example, I'm going to, actually we don't have internet, do we have internet access in here? No, there is a lot of in public and you should be able to get it. Also, you should make the phone slightly larger as you write on it. 
if I can remember how to do that in a squeak. Someone <laughs> here must know. <laughs> Someone must know. Michael's laughing because he's probably deleted that right sheet. Pardon me, the phone larger? The microphone larger. Right click on the desktop and there is an appearance menu and there is font under that. I'm sure. But you're going to change a few of them because it's one setting for each. I'll, I'll leave it. No, 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 try not to different in a de in demonstration. So we're going to get something like font set for Asian. So I'm going to... I'm just going to take this little chunk of S unit, old ancient S unit code here and, and run this um, test selector, which um, it basically does this setup uh, AUG audio normally and play it from an HTTP source. So this kind of gets into the power of what you're able to do. So in theory, when I play this file, it should run out to the internet and get this from the gutenberg.org and uh, play five seconds of it. Um, and then uh, set it to null and release. So that's actually one of the S unit tests to confirm that this level of complexity works. The, the method is actually here. Um, the interesting thing here is that this piece here, which I'm sure Neil can't read up here in the back. Um, yes? You can control and zoom in, put on the Mac. I can control? Control and zoom in with two. Oh well, yes, I can. And that's actually if you have the feature turned on. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> that. I know you're, that, that's a disability feature on okay. the Mac, the operating system, right. and, um, and I don't remember the, the standing here, I can't remember what it is, but I know I have it turned on because I returned it on for Sophie just to understand how it works. Um, I was going to talk here about this audio part. This is a typical command line, Unix command line, which says run gsm launch, set the target to this aug file, aug demux it, give it a name, run the Vorbis decoder, audio convert in OSX audio sync. So that's what it looks like on the command line. I mean, it's really short and concise, but when you have one that's a little more complex, you have to sit there for three or four minutes trying to figure out what it means. And it also has this inner, it's kind of like APL, kind of. Not, not maybe a thousand less complex, but there's probably four different ways to represent it on the Unix command line. Um, but that was the, I could take this actually and paste it into a terminal session and run it, it should work. But um, you can see here I actually call this GNOME file services source, the AugDemux, the Vorbis, the audio sync, audio convert, convert and um, Hook them all together, and um, the other magic in here is I have this pad added, which is a bus message that we get to say that a pad was dynamically added. So at that point, we need to do this dynamically hook the pad up. But let me just try running it. it'll never work in a demo. This is a LibriVox recording. Oh, it does work. <laughs> All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit... should start. Yep, thank you. It's always good when this thing works. Thank you. <laughs> but you can see here, I just played a file from the internet. And so... That's kind of the beauty of the, the GStreamer environment. It lets you do these very complex things and push the, the, the responsibility of having it work to somewhere, someone else. Yes? I'm not sure I understand. Yeah, 
think so. No, I don't know. Uh, ask me afterwards. Okay. So as I mentioned, this guy here, what, what it would do is it would print all this fun um, Unix people, Linux people like this. They need to see stuff scroll by. You notice on the squeak side it did nothing, and I was kind of like, is it going to work or not? But you could actually put stuff to transcript or some other messaging subsystem if it makes you feel more comfortable. Um, and I already talked about the fact that there's multiple ways to do it and so forth. So um, what I mentioned was is that you've got these components, you hook them all together, and hopefully then you get sound at the back. Now I just talked a little bit about the dynamic pad. Uh, this request for callback signal is kind of a little magic ugly magic that has to happen because um, when you start uh, the um, pipeline playing, the um, DMUX runs off and figures out what the file is and then it wants to create these paths, but you're sitting over here in Smalltalk waiting for the um, pad to be created and so you kind of have this issue because the, the base squeak VM doesn't support um, callback to small talk. And so we, we have a, a, a special setup where you pass in some data. So when we get when we see the, the message about pad added that we know how to interpret the pad added to be able to hook up um, the elements that are needed. So actually once I've actually got <coughs> it all hooked up um, the other interesting thing about GStreamer is that it is um, time-based or database or something. You can send um, seek messages to the pipeline so that you can seek in second, seconds or seek uh, in time. Uh, you can also seek sometimes into packets or data bytes and stuff. And you know they've decided that um, you need to pass in nanoseconds. That's the, the base model for time. Um, also, there's C percent, so forth. So, um, given that, that let me then take uh, the original um, morphic player for the MPEG player, um, which was written by John Maloney, based on some work I did um, about eight years ago now. And uh, we took that and cloned that in order to come up with an AUG player for the old PC. So let me just show that. So I have an AUG file here. Uh, it's an audio file. So I'm going to start it up, and it's going to take four or five seconds to start because if there's a bug where when we start it up, we don't know what it is. Because it says uh, .aug, and an AUG file can be either audio, video, or both. Um, and so we kind of hang out around for five seconds trying to figure out if uh, this file's got audio or video. And it doesn't have video, so therefore it errors. But if I wait long enough, it should bring up a, a little blue morphic player, and um, it should let me then play this. Odd file. This is a LibreVox recording. And of course, uh, then we can speak through it. Other vessels of still great so, science. And quit. Um, so you can see it behaves the same as the, the MPEG player. Um, I should mention, of course, if you, if someone has the desire, they could load the, the GStreamer MPEG player and then do a little bit of work here to um, play MPEG-4 or some other type of video type and squeak. Because um, let me just try this one, which is video and audio. So I grabbed this one because the Linux, um, for this particular conference, they made AUG files available. So the issue is where you get your AUG files from. So. Does anyone know this guy? I showed this 
actually there's someone and they actually knew who this guy was. So. But you can see it's um, it's not too bad. Oh, come on here. Actually, I could rotate this if you want, because it, yes? Who's keeping the timing? Is it Squeak, or she is she streamer, or...? Oh, uh, Jay Streamer is, is keeping, the, keeping the timing. I haven't done very much, too much, I haven't done any research in terms of the, the quality. Basically, what's going on here is that um, there's a, um, a fake um, sync element which signals a semaphore a squeak semaphore. So we're basically sitting here waiting for the next frame to appear. And when the next frame appears, then we then bled it to the um, uh, to morph it. But you can see that it looked pretty good. Do you know if it has any native thread? Native thread, right. Oh yes, it, it runs P threads. There's a whole P thread architecture behind behind it. And they, they have an element, for example, called Q which is actually sets up a P-thread um, uh, interface, uh, asynchronous interface. So actually, I set up the P-thread in I use a Q object in order for this to all work. And actually, um, I also, I don't get the audio data to squeak because I decided, well, it's a waste of time for, for, for JSTreamer to decode the audio give it to me, and then I give it to the sound system through the, through the squeak VM. So I just actually set up the stream to say, you play directly to the sound hardware um, instead, and bypass squeak completely. And so JStreamer is responsible for the synchronization of the, of the sound and the, and the video too. So it, it actually, under the covers, is doing all this time management and synchronization for you. And so that's one of the, the benefits of using this versus rolling your own type of system. Um, as I, I, I jump to saying that you can use Squeak as a sync source. So there are some um, hookup methods that you can take a look at that basically um, let you um, uh, give audio or video data to Squeak or take audio or video data from Squeak. Um, I'll admit actually there's still work to be done on using Squeak as a source for audio and video. There's, um, if, but is anyone interested in doing that, by the way? Okay, so um, if someone wants to work on that, that would be really great. So I have done stuff where you generate some sound um, from Squeak and send it into GStreamer. The interesting thing then is you can then actually, you know, do encoding if you have a an encoder from somewhere like the AUG one, then you can build your own AUG, AUG files from generated um, squeak audio and video. So, as I mentioned, um, it's an exercise for the reader, so I don't have a working example. Um, there's some other things in streamer that I haven't looked at. Um, there's this whole playband guy, which um, some fellow decided that he would tackle the whole issue of if I took an arbitrary um, media file and then I had an arbitrary um, uh, playback device, you should be able to just feed the two, three components together and playband should figure out all the complexity of, of that. Um, I was uh, using it a little bit and it seemed to work, but it, it's actually broken on the OLPC, so I don't have an example which works. But someone could figure out how to get that to work on any other type of Linux, Linux or, or Windows platform. <coughs> so I think that's it. Do you have any questions?
Yes. There's 100 non-name primitives. Well, because, for example, you have, you have type, type uh, you have like a dozen, for example, a dozen type, different data types. So then there's 24 calls there to get and put each one of those data types. And um, there's then, you know, calls to set attributes in a pad, get attributes in a pad, interpret uh, the mind data, build a, uh, capability from a mind string, and so yeah, there's lots of, um, of primitive <coughs> calls under the cover. Um, well, FFI is not offered on the on the eToy environment, which was this is also a target. <coughs> so I had to do primitives instead. Yeah, so as I mentioned, you can use, in theory, you can, uh, I've written the code so that you can, and had some test harnesses so that you could take uh, a ch an audio buffer and give it to GStreamer, or a video buffer and give it to GStreamer. So you can, you can do that if you have a situation, say, I don't know, you're making data, but you want to create a video out of that data, frames of data. In theory, you can feed that into GStreamer and get MPEG-4 of the back end um, with the right with an MPEG-4 um, encoder. No, I don't know that, but probably does. There's lots of there's, in the audio side. There's there's all sorts of stuff for doing uh, mixing and, and um, manipulation of. Okay.